Welcome to Candid Coffee 2022. I'm Danny Ratliff here with Richard Rosso. We appreciate you guys joining us this morning. Um, going to get it back into the basics here, guys. So talk a little bit about things you can do to start the year off right and then really get back to the uh, the reason we do these is to answer your questions. So um, we're going to jump right in today. 2022 Smart Money Tips. We're going to talk about some pretty basic stuff here, but we've got to take care of a little bit of house cleaning. So disclosures, we are Clarity Financial doing business as RIA advisors. We are a registered investment advisor with the Securities and Exchange Commission. So keep in mind, all of these things can be, uh, they're not custom recommendations for each individual, uh, but these are things that we think that each person could put into play. And hopefully you could find some things that are going to help you out throughout this session today. Um, and you have any more personalized questions, we're certainly happy to answer or uh, schedule some time to visit later on. Um, so Rich, let's jump right in. You know, what's the thing that you and I talk about all the time when it comes to resolutions? Oh, I was listening to, uh, I can't remember what news show this morning, ABC or whatever. And they're talking about financial resolutions. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Resolutions are something that die. As a matter of fact, most of them are probably already dead already. We don't want this stuff to die for you. We want to bring it to life. And resolutions just sound too hard. So it's just like, incorporation of things that you're probably doing. So very small steps, not big leaps. Small steps, small boring steps lead to better wealth. I bet most of the people that are sitting in on this this morning are gonna go, yeah, been there, done that, been doing that, right? But I bet you know someone who hasn't or you need to remind someone to do it, these things that we're gonna share. So the resolutions in life don't really work. Um, there are small things that lead to big leaps, big habits, and that's what we're going to talk about today. One of those rules is uh, forget resolutions. If there's any rule you want to ever learn, Danny and I always on the radio show talk about these, these, uh, these tenets that we don't like, that financial mainstream media, media tends to promote. And, but the one we all agree on is pay yourself first, right, Danny? Right. That's exactly right. So before anything happens, you withdraw money to go into your emergency account or in your retirement account that pay yourself first, that delaying of gratification is the most important step. It's like if I'm building a house and I got a bunch of dirt, I'm sticking the shovel into it. That's your first step. So forget the resolutions. Just think about very small steps that are going to get big results. Well, it's like you and I discussed yesterday on the show is that people make these grand resolutions that are great in nature, but the problem with them historically is that they're so grand that we get overwhelmed, they're, we feel like it's unachievable over time, and so by doing it you know, very small, a little bit at a time, it certainly seems to help. So paying yourself first, always a great thing, really basic template here, guys, um, something that you should always think about. Um, and then you know, we talk about backwards, right? You want to go back? We I'm talked here. about that. I moved that ahead first, but paying yourself first, that's the, we're the sucker for that one. But go back to tip one. You hear this stuff, cut out the latte. Yeah, okay. Because if I save three bucks a day, four bucks a day, I'm going to be a millionaire. Nah, that's not it. It's the habit. It's the actual habit of saying, I'm going to stop doing this, buying this coffee, making it at home right? In, as a result, I'm going to take control over my finances. See, it's the emotional component of cutting out the latte. It's not the four or five bucks. Yeah, it's nice to have that. But what you're proving to yourself is that you could do it. So cutting out the latte um, is not, again, not going to get you wealthy. It might give you a couple of grand over the lifetime or whatever, but, but it's, the, it's the act. And then with big purchases, what I do is I give myself a waiting period. If I want to do something big, I'm going to spend more than a hundred bucks. What I am going to do is I'm going to put it on my calendar and I'm going to look at this thing in seven days and 14 days to see if I still want it. You guess what, Danny? Eight out of 10 times, I don't want it anymore. Because guess right. what I'm doing along? Guess what my brain is doing over that seven to 14 days? I'm thinking about one, where can I spend the money elsewhere? What can I do with it? What's the opportunity cost of buying this and not this? Two, do I have something already that's close to what I want to buy that I don't need to buy this? 
it's very effective to take a step back with big purchases. Now, I needed a new water heater. I, I can't step back from that, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just uh, things leak, you got to change them. I'm talking about, hey, I really would like this new laptop bag or whatever it is. Give yourself time to digest that purchase. And I would dare to say most of the time, you'll let the big purchase go. You'll find you don't need it. When you create those habits, kind of like people say success breeds success. And it does, because when you start cutting off some of the small things, you tend to look at other items as well and say, okay, maybe I don't need that as much. Not right. just a cup of coffee or whatever it may be. Now, I know that cup of coffee drives you crazy because that's what every you know, large institution will tell you. If you only cut back on this, you yeah, would have X I, amount of dollars. Think about it. If I go ahead and I cut that money out and I put it into the market for 100 years and I make 10% a year, yeah, yeah, I can believe that fairy tale, right? But that's not the truth. It's the action. The action behind cutting a latte. The action behind bringing your lunch to work as opposed to buying it at the deli. The action. Yeah, the, the extra money is helpful, but it's the action. I'm like my grandmother this morning with the finger. Right? Oh, Nana Rosso. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So we talked about pay yourself first. We're going to skip, skip through this here. And then, you know, that this goes in reverse. We've, we talked about this actually this week as well in the sense of, you know, watching the subscriptions, watching monthly payments, keeping a really good um, you know, eye on that will help you. I mean, we talked about, I've had this happen where I wanted to watch a sports event, had to go get ESPN plus told myself I was going to stop it. And, you know, life gets in the way. Next thing you know, I get an email from ESPN. I'm like, wait a second. That's right. I do have that. So I have to go back and cancel it. Wasn't much, but I think it was like five bucks a month, but it all adds up, especially if you, next thing you know, you have seven, eight, nine, ten 10 of them. And you can start to see quite a bit of leakage within your, your budget. The thing, I think when you do this thinking backwards, now, there have been some great programs. It was a Facebook, not a Facebook program. Yeah, maybe it was where you can age yourself. Like it'll show you, it'll go through the face recognition yep. and you can, now I will tell you, there are studies that were used at Merrill Lynch that showed you how effective that was for retirement planning, where when they took clients faces and aged them 30, 40 years and had them face their older self, people started to make better decisions because I'm bringing the future into the present. And that was such a strong visual so before you make every purchase that will increase, and, and what you want to do is increase your hesitancy to spend and create breathing room, is think about the beneficial, the end game of this. I did this with someone, and the reason I'm bringing about a computer backpack, I was talking to a younger investor, and he goes, really, you know, this backpack, everybody's got it. I'm like, oh, okay, what could it be, 40 bucks? $500. Rich, those like, things are crazy. $500 so for a backpack? Okay, let's go ahead and do this exercise. Let's think about it. Well, I lost and I won. He didn't get the $500 backpack. He bought one for $75. So we're going to take that as a win. But because he thought about it, he said it's ridiculous. Think of the impact on that. You could put that other money into your Roth, right? So here's what we did. We took the rest of the money. We put 75, he bought the backpack. He put the rest into his Roth. And I, he says, I feel good. I made a, a, I, I bought what I wanted. It's not exactly the same. I thought about it and I made a better decision because I looked at the financially beneficial end game. I had him use those words, a mouthful as they are. So that's what you all need to do. Most importantly, you all probably have it. We have about 78 people on this, on this with us right now. Good morning. Your kids, your grandkids. This is, this is one of those lessons you teach them. Very important. Think yeah. backward to move forward. Well, and I agree. You know, it's funny you mentioned a backpack. Michelle, she got me a backpack for Christmas. She said, Aww. oh, you need a nice one. You need one for work. And I thought, uh, eh, you know, pretty structured. You've, you've seen them, right? I mean, and yeah. uh, I thought, you know, I really don't need this. Just go get me a little Adidas backpack. I'm, I'm, I'll be okay. And then I found out how much they cost. And she is, I mean... I'm pretty frugal. She's extremely frugal. Well, she so for her to, to go shame. out on a limb, yeah, she puts you to shame. Yeah, she if for her to go out on a limb and go buy a nice backpack, like when I found out the cost, I almost fell over. I was like, "Whoa, are you okay?" I had to check her temperature. But uh, we marched back to the store and took it back right away because I was like, "This is this is ridiculous." 
But those things add up. I mean, it's easy to, to kind of get in your head that somebody needs this or you need this, and uh, it's easy to spend the money. Now, I'm not saying this is an excuse, but if you did spend that money on a backpack, what you would do, you would die with that backpack. There's no other yeah. backpack ever in life. Like, it'll go on to the kids. The kids will use it. I mean, you'll get your money's worth out of it because it'll last. Uh, my brief, years. yeah. My briefcase and backpacker, I mean, they're on their last legs and she what, knows it. And yeah, yeah. Anyway, all good. So this is really, you guys are going to think, wait a second, why the heck is a financial advisor talking about exercise? But we talk about health and wealth and how intertwined they are, especially later in life. And this is huge. And well, um, well this is a mental exercise. Correct. Right. right. Mental. You got to work out physically because health equal wealth. Wealth. You've got to look at, and this is what super savers do. They count, the whole world lives on monthly payments. And, oh, I really want this, you know, $100,000 car. How much is the monthly payment? Well, you know, 700,000 months, it's only $100. That's how people live today. We don't want to live like this. We want to look at, even at a low rate, what my interest charge is. This is what super savers do. So they look at, okay, I'm going to finance this automobile if you can find one at $22,000. At 3.49%, right? And here's going to be my payment. But what's, and here's my loan interest. Now, say I go 72 months. Okay, so then what happens with super savers, they go, okay. They don't focus on the $23,000 anymore. They're focusing on the 2,500. If they're going to make that loan, at least they know what the interest is and guess what they're going to do? They're going to accelerate it depending upon the rate of interest that they're paying versus the rate of interest that they're going to get on something else, right? They're going to do that. That's what super savers do. They don't look at the, oh, this payment's only 300 bucks. They look at the interest rate and the term of that, of that loan. And then they put that big number in their head and they work backwards. So that's, that's how you look at breaking this monthly payment addiction that most people have. Why are we so worried that the Fed's going to raise rates, Danny? Because the whole world lives on monthly payments and to be a borrower. Again, I'm going to dare to say not a lot of the people fitting in on this, but it's a good reminder for everybody because even people that are financially or fiscally responsible may not be going through the steps of looking at the total calculation of interest. Not only that, I, the best super savers also will take into account the cost of maintenance. I have one client who will not buy a foreign car. Why? Because when he looked at the, the maintenance on the Mercedes versus Toyota, right? Comparable price. The maintenance, total maintenance of oil changes and everything else for that automobile switched him to Toyota. That's a smart way to be financially responsible for your household. Yeah, very easy to do. Very easy to get caught up into. So I think that exercise of going through that and, you know, talking about health, but the hell your financial health here is easy to slip away in this payment world. I mean, think about the iPhone, Rich. Remember when the iPhone came out at a thousand bucks and you and I were like, oh my goodness, people are nuts. They're going to go buy this. But they were genius. They created an annuity stream for themselves and, and revenue and said, hey guys, no big deal. It's a monthly payment. But guess what? Now you're going to have that monthly payment for the rest of your life, if you want an iPhone, right? Because everybody switches, they know this. I mean, it was a smart move. And I really part, thought right? when that happened, it would slow down the sales of the iPhone, but I should have really known it wasn't. No, for sure. So again, we always talk about Roth and Roth 401k. And Roth have certain contribution limits um, to, and, and they're pretty generous. Roths go in after tax, at retirement, come out completely tax-free. Uh, Roth 401ks work like traditional 401ks. The gist of this is if you think you're going to retire and fall into the lowest tax bracket, you are sadly mistaken. This is a story made in the 90s and it never died. Will some of you fall into the lowest tax bracket? Yeah, some of you will. Most of you won't because what Danny and I consider are taxes on Social Security and possible IRMA or premium charges on top of your Medicare ongoing costs of premiums. So I always tell younger people, especially, fund Roth first. 
not traditional. How many people, how many younger people do you get in the office or you talk on the phone where you get a lot of dead space or they sit and look at, they look, they got that glazed look because they already had talked to someone else that told them, do the traditional 401k, right? Pre-tax, save money now, save taxes now, do that. Uh, also, uh, you know, don't ignore the HS health savings account, do all these other things. We do the total opposite. It's pretty funny. We actually go the opposite way. So they look at us like, yeah, that's totally different than what that person said. Yeah, we did. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so you know, yeah. the, the, the Roth, and here's another thing with the Roth 401k. We hear quite frequently that people say, oh, I make too much money for a Roth. Well, that may be the case for a Roth IRA. The Roth 401k has no income limitations. So right. don't hesitate to put those funds there. And if you're not comfortable putting everything there, maybe hedge your bets. Do half in traditional, half, half in the Roth. You will still, even with those Roth contributions, you'll still get your company matched. They will just match into the traditional or pre-tax space. So, you know, we encourage everybody to look at your own financial situation. This is all about giving yourself flexibility later down the road. And I think that's so important that, you know, you have that flexibility. So then you can be in much more control. And, you know, the way we, we typically discuss these pre-tax accounts is imagine you have a business and you have a unique partnership. Your partner's Uncle Sam. But the really unique thing about this is they can change their ownership percentage at any time and you can't control that. And then they're going to tell you how much you have to take out of your business each and every year as you age and, and get to your required minimum distribution age at 72. So this is really important to have that type of flexibility because you may think, well, hey, you know, the, by my calculations, they're only going to get, um, you know, let's say your effective tax rates 14 or 15 percent. But if they raise taxes, that may go up to 20 percent. On a million dollar account, which you know that's uh, you know, we're seeing people who are you're, you're having to save more and more just to retire, especially with inflation costs. What happens? That's pretty significant as far as what comes out of that, as far as you giving away, you not being able to utilize. So a lot of this is about keeping more money in your pocket. I know everybody's really you know wants to talk about investing, what to do in 2022, and we're going to get there here in just a moment. But make those considerations. Keep that in mind. Yep. Let's move quick. Diversification of account. Hey man, I'm moving. You, you really are. One thing we want to say here is you're always told, and we have one question from a gentleman that asked about uh, post 70, you know, 72 RDs taking control, I think, for tax purposes. Well, the one thing you want to do is you don't want everything in a pre tax account. We've been told to put all our money in 401k pre tax accounts. So when you go to retirement, you only have one account to draw from. Think about you owning a farm for sustenance and you only have one magical animal that's gonna do everything for you. It doesn't work this way. You have to diversify your accounts for greater tax control. For people who are taking, say for example, required minimum distributions, what we try to do is say, okay, here's your distribution. You have this amount up to your next tax bracket. Let's not let that tax bracket go to waste. We'll pull that money out. Guess what we'll do with it? We'll either put it into Roth or after tax brokerage for spending later. Because if you tell me, if you come to me and you get, or Danny and you go, hey, Rich, gosh, you know, I really want this, I really want this item. It's $50,000. I have plenty of money in my uh, 401k to take it. Okay. Well, guess what that 50000 is? Taxed as ordinary income, possibly trigger more social security taxes. Depending upon where you are in the marginal tax rate, you could be paying more of a premium on Part B and Part D for Medicare. So everything you do from a IRA pre-tax, that tax that comes out is like a water, it's like a waterfall all over the rest of your port, uh, of your finances. It has a huge impact to it. But what if you had needed 50,000 and I could take some from the IRA, some from brokerage, some from Roth, and guess what? Keep your tax bracket level. Doesn't budge. Diversification of accounts is very important. We also talk about um, the Fed's going to raise rates at least four times. Let's face it. They're going to have, matter of fact, what I guess, Danny, what we're worried about is they're way behind the eight ball, right? They're still doing emergency procedures and we allegedly don't have any emergency. So when the time comes, what are they going to have to do? Is four enough? Mike Leibowitz on our team wrote a great article that says that the market always 100%, right, uh, does not take into account the full move of the Fed. They're always underestimating how much the Fed needs to move. Now, the good part is if interest rates, short-term rates go up, 
your interest rate should go up on checking, savings, money market. Well, not maybe at your brick and mortar bank. They're sitting on so much cash right now, they don't need to give you any incentive. They don't care. If you, they don't care. Frankly, they don't care. They have too much cash. They want you to take it out. They would rather you borrow, right? Be a borrower and go back to the payments. Forget the savings thing. They don't make money on that. They want you to borrow. So think about this. Marcus by Goldman, uh, Synchrony Bank, Ally Bank, all online banks, which I use. I don't use, I don't have one brick and mortar bank because I'm earning much higher interest rates than I am on my traditional brick and mortar bank. And I always, what I notice, Danny, is when rates do go up, these online banks, the next day, send me an email going, rates have gone up, our rates gone up. So you want to say, how can, why do you want to wait in line at a bank? Look at online. How many people wait in line at a bank anymore? These rates are going to be better. Now, we've converted a lot of people. We don't make money on online banks, by the way. Um, it's just a way for you to earmark for emergencies and our financial vulnerability cushion. That is another six months of living expenses in cash for bigger things, right? So we have our, full, uh, our SVC, that additional six months of cash reserve set aside for expenses such as job loss. With the great resignation going on, what's still going on as far as tumultuous trends, people who tell us they've done this have fared the best. We started talking about this right before the pandemic and it worked very well for a lot of people. This yeah, little did moment. we know a pandemic was coming. We just thought markets were extremely overvalued. There were going to be potential issues in the future. Things were going very well. And, you know, those are things that I think that, you know, when people are out of a job and like you mentioned, the water heater breaks, the car breaks down. Now you have the money to meet your monthly cash flow, but also meet those additional emergency expenses. So I think that old school rule of thumb needs to maybe be thrown out the window to some extent and not just say, hey, what are, what are my expenses? And I need to have six months or 12 months, depending on your job. If, you know, if you're a dual household, uh, dual income household, um, you know, you need to go a little bit further and say, what if I'm out of work and mm -hmm. this happens or that happens? So think a little bit further down the line in that regard. So talk about health and wealth connected. Um, you go to a gym right now. Most people who go to a gym regularly are, are you know, rolling their eyes because they're like, oh, yeah, I know how that goes. Can't even get on the treadmill right now because everybody's back into the, um, you know, get back in health mode, which is great. But where are we? We're on the 15th. I think what do we have? Like four more days. What do I say? Most people's resolutions go like 19 days, something like that. Um, yeah. I mean, I just noticed that people cut when they want to cut expenses, they cut the gym. And that's like, I do the opposite. I'm like, listen, health and wealth are connected dollar wise. The healthier I am in retirement, the better retirement I'm going to have, the less I'm going to spend on out of pocket healthcare costs, right? Long term, your health is an investment. So if you're going to buy the treadmill and it's not going to be a clothes hanger, buy it. Uh, I have a client that wanted to buy a Peloton bike and I'm like, Ooh, that's pretty expensive. He could afford it, but I was like, okay, well, let's talk about it. Are you going to use it and all that? Now he keeps me up to date. He's already lost 12 pounds since now November. Uh, he is using it. Um, that's a big expense and it's a monthly expense, yep. but we cut that's some the other with those. I mean, most people don't take into account that not only are you buying or paying for the bike on a monthly basis, but you're also paying for the service. You know, sometimes you may get it for free for a year. And now one thing to check is some credit cards do offer a rebate basically on Peloton or some of the other bikes. So take a look at some of those things and don't leave that, those benefits on the table. Yeah. I mean, again, health is wealth, however you do it. Uh, you spend a little bit more on fresh foods. You spend, you, uh, you have, you take vitamin supplements, but you're doing something proactively. That's not the category to cut. And I noticed, Danny, that is the first category. The health regimen will lead to a better wealth position for you down the road. Absolutely. Right. And here are studies that even show that. We also found that this is the Journal of Psychological Science from 2014 that showed, and this is from the abstract, that the, how people say for retirement that their health improvements and what they save are highly correlated because guess what, Danny, and what I think it is too. That. People are more disciplined, right? If I'm putting money away and I'm paying myself first, I'm not for immediate gratification. I'm delaying gratification, which means that's what, I mean, like when I have to go to the gym uh, and run and do that, I mean, I'm like, I don't really want to do this. Do I want to do this? No, but I'm looking longer term that how I feel, I have to sort of psych myself up 
Um, I think once you have discipline in finance, you have discipline in other areas of your life. And this study uh, showed that. And you have to remember the Fidelity Retiree Healthcare Cost Estimate, recent one from 2021, said a retired couple age 65 may require $300,000 saved to cover healthcare expenses. And that's Medicare premiums and everything over your lifetime. But what I'm saying is a lot of money goes to healthcare. And we also calculate in our financial plans the out-of-pocket cost of retirement. One little point I'm going to make for you, when we run plans, people who are unhealthy, their out-of-pocket costs are anywhere from 20 to 50% higher than a person who's healthy. And so, so if you're doing really good stuff with your wealth, you can apply those principles to your health. And this study shows that. Cool study. All right, financial vulnerability. We talked about the cushion, but we are also going to say, okay, what's your next level of household financial protection? Your net worth is under attack from issues all the time, right? So wealthier households have to mitigate liability. You have to protect your home. Uh, umbrella coverage, which I have, right? Um, Danny, you probably have, right? You have a robust word statement. You, you look at your maximum limits on your auto and homeowners policy. You know, I'll give you one example, but umbrella insurance is very, very cheap. But one thing I will show you is like on auto insurance here in Houston, the state says, well, you need this amount for uninsured motorists. You need this amount for this. This I'm like, uh, 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 I think it today. I'm going to call my insurance agent. No, I know this is Houston and how many uninsured motorists we have. And my odds of getting hit by an uninsured motorist are pretty high. So we're going to hike that. In other words, you've got to take control over your risk mitigation. So this financial vulnerability assessment that goes like, here's my wonderful net worth. Who can attack it? Like, here's my hive. And I got these strange bees from out of town that are going to come in and attack it. How do I protect my hive? So we have to look at expanding the definition of financial vulnerability. John Penzon, what else he says, when his children reached the age to drive, first step he took was purchasing an umbrella policy. John Penn's part of our team. Smart John Penn. I would do that uh, prior to children driving, just in general, just God forbid you get in a wreck, something happens, but um, something certainly everybody needs to have. Well, something will trigger you, and that's good that you did it. But this is where you want to yep. look at the homework. And I just showed you my, you know, how Texas law requires drivers to look at, you know, twenty five thousand coverage for accidents, uh, property damage, the thirty sixty twenty five. Mine is one hundred, three hundred, one hundred. I mean, my insurance agent loves me, obviously, but because I pay more. But the point is, I know my town. I know how I drive here, where I go. And I felt that this was more comfortable. Also, I need to get up to these limits to purchase my umbrella coverage. Correct. So a lot of times you're gonna you're gonna visit with your rep to purchase your umbrella because they're gonna want everything. They're gonna want to see everything under one place. They may have to you increase limits in certain areas. So this wouldn't be where you'd say, "Hey, I have a buddy who does insurance as well. I'm gonna go talk to him over here, and then to my other agents over here." You're gonna want that together. Yeah. All right, guys. So kind of got through the the, the general like you know. Good tips, reminders for the year to start 2022 off right. Uh, we have lots of questions to get to, so we're going to answer some of these questions that we received already. Um, just a good good reminder, there is a Q&A here on your toolbar for Zoom. Uh, if you have any questions, please go there. Uh, any comments, hey. things that you want us to address. We'll try to get to it all today. If you don't, you're going to have an opportunity at the end of this session to schedule us some time to visit. If you want somebody to, from RIA to contact you, we'd be happy to do so, talk one-on-one, -on -one, give you some ideas. You can also always email Rich, myself, uh, John, uh, we're always happy to answer questions for you or go to realinvestmentadvice.com, go to the ask a question tab at the top and uh, that'll go straight to Lance and uh, we'll make sure that gets to the right person. So, Brent, well, go well, we have one good question I want to hit before because we're talking about this financial assessment. Yep. Uh, there's a question about, well, how can you guys be fiduciaries and offer insurance? That's a good question because what we do is if you work with an insurance, and I listen, I like my insurance agent at Allstate a lot. So, but I tell him what to do. This is what I want. You know, I understand the policies and this is what I want. The point is, if you, you we can offer insurance to you in a fiduciary manner. And that means that you go and sit with an insurance salesman, they're not looking at a financial plan first to figure out how much insurance you need. Being an insurance fiduciary, in our opinion, is there are times where people don't need insurance. I mean, we go through plans. How many plans do you go yep. through, Danny, to get to the point of life insurance and or 
long-term uh, care. Long-term um, care. And yeah. we have gone to the fact that you don't need it. That's the highest and best interest of the client. We want to make sure it's available to you if you want it. We also want to make sure that we do the homework for, the, and also will, you know, carve the proper insurance linked to the plan that you need, as opposed to, oh yeah, Danny, you need long-term care coverage. Well, but I have no, no, you need that. And here's so, the estimate of what it's going to cost you. You're gonna, you need seven thousand dollars every month, and we're gonna inflate that. But they never take into account that you have Social Security or the assets that you have and the income that it can generate right. or any other pension income, things of that nature. So what we find many times is that, you know, by doing the full financial plan, being holistic in nature, we can take a big picture view. And right. a lot of times we whittle that down to something that's more uh, it's more appropriate for the individual or the family. And so I or think that's a really important aspect. Or not at all. And yeah. we also what we encourage is that here's what we would offer you. Now go back to your do your homework. But at, so, least, at least what we've done is saying, you don't need a million dollars in life insurance. You need $150,000 in life insurance. So at least what we've done is giving you the right number. If you want to go out and shop at anywhere else, we don't care. We just want to give you the option, you know, to have it available to you. Here's the kicker. So, you know, insurance agency is completely independent from any, any large institution, just similar to the RIA that, that we run. Mm -hmm. And so the importance of that is, is that, you know, a lot of these companies, you're going to see some of the pricier places, the big names, and you're going to pay more to do business with them because they're doing the market, the marketing, the advertising, they're doing the things to give you that name brand recognition, and you pay for that. And a lot of these companies actually, in fact, have a another company that they don't advertise that's actually a bit cheaper that a lot of independent agents will use. And so what we are able to do is go out and look, you know, scan the universe for the best companies, the better prices, and ensure that our clients are able to take advantage of that. So essentially what it came down to at some point was that we had people saying, hey, you know what, why don't you guys do this? You're giving us all the advice for it. And so this is a great opportunity to keep it in-house, to really understand and to make sure that people are being treated properly. So we have a, a very good insurance agent who's been in the business for many years, um, ran his own agency for a long time. And essentially, so now, and this is something good for most people to know, is that we have the ability, and not Rich and I, we're not doing that, but we have somebody who does, who they do property and casualty. We can do disability. We can do, which we've always done, long-term care, life insurance for estate planning purposes, for growth purposes, for you know risk mitigation. I mean, all these things that we can do in-house and have a better understanding and have a, somebody that we can visit with to update the financial plan, to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I think that's right. extremely important. It has to be done in a fiduciary manner. I don't understand how you can buy, we said this on the radio show yesterday, Danny. I don't know how you can just go out and buy a long-term care policy without knowing exactly how much you need and or if you need it at all. I just read a plan for somebody yesterday who was very concerned about long-term care, but he doesn't have a legacy to leave. I said, you're covered. You don't need long-term care. The plan shows it. If I were strictly an insurance sales person, I probably would say you need it, but he didn't. And there's where the fiduciary comes into play. All right, Rich, we got a lot of questions. Let's, so oh, let's get let's into go. some more here. So uh, I want to jump right in. We, we have a really good one. So um, somebody who's full retirement age, plans on staying at work and also claiming social security. Is this a bad idea due to tax on wages and social security together? Or what should they consider mm -hmm. doing uh, also funding 401k at 15% and plan to work for a couple more years. So this is a good instance, Rich, where it's not going to hurt you to take that social security. However, you do get that 8% bump each year. And so what we typically recommend is somebody do a life expectancy quiz. You know, you know, <clears throat> you know, your health, you know, your spouse's health, if you're married, and let's take a look at the big picture. Let's see how, what's the best way for you to maximize your social security. Now, there may be an instance where you absolutely need these funds and that's okay. If you need them to live on, go ahead and take them. Yeah. However, um, the key here is after full retirement age, if you're going to take it before, which we see a lot of people do this and make a costly decision is that if you take it prior to that, you're going to have a reduction of benefits, but not only that, you're going to have benefits withheld if you make over a certain amount, and that amount is not much, it's just under $19,000. So consider this, if you're going to, we have seen people take it early, make an emotional decision, say, I'm getting everything I can out of social security. And I can tell you right now, we know the numbers inside and out. That is typically not the case, unless you have a very short time window for a life expectancy. 
that would be a, a reason that maybe you would take it. But you're also going to be penalized there and you're going to be taking a reduced amount for the rest of your life. So if you're over full retirement age, it's okay, but you're getting that 8% bump each year, which I don't know any place is going to give you a true 8%. I think you, you delay when possible. What do you think, Rich? Um, yeah, and I'm going to say just to this person, don't feel bad. I understand you took it at full retirement age. You probably should have waited maybe to age 70 to get a bigger bump, but it's probably too late to reverse it if you, do it, if you did it uh, longer than 12 months ago uh, and pay everything back in. So that's okay. You're just going to pay a little more taxes on it. Um, so to Danny's point, as long as you took it at full retirement age, now I will tell you, if you're going to be retiring in a couple of years, I would shut down the traditional 401k. In I would shut that and see if you have a Roth 401k. I would be contributing to that. Remember, we talked about diversification of accounts. If I'm two to five years from retirement, I want to shut down my traditional 401k. I want to turn on my Roth 401k. 401k is 401k. Your contributions go in after tax. The match goes in pre. Absolutely. Okay, so Rich, today's market environment is obviously starting off 2022, a little bit of volatility. What, um, and, and obviously we're seeing quite a bit of inflation. We think inflation is, um, we look at a year over year numbers, it's still pretty hot. At some point though, it begins to taper off. We look at 2022 versus 2021. But where are areas, and especially specifically fixed income, because we're getting a ton of questions on fixed income right now. And we've changed the way we invest in fixed income, what, a year and a half, two years ago, from historically buying individual bonds, holding those, um, still running credit analysis, things of that nature, to being more proactive managers surrounding the yield curve, kind of a range that, that fixed income has been in. And then also looking at a little bit more of a hybrid approach as well. What would you say to somebody, you know, looking at how do I hedge against uh, inflation? How do I hedge against the market? Where, where does somebody go? Uh, oh boy, I missed that whole thing because I'm answering a question. <laughs> oh, get out of here. I don't have enough coffee, uh, but go ahead. because. You're, you're killing me here. So you're well, killing well, me with answers, questions. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, go, yeah, go, yeah. Ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So, so I, I think the kicker here is so, so to answer this question is essentially we've had to be extremely nimble. And if, if you're a client of ours and we've had a, a discussion as of recent, you'll probably you know hear that word frequently from me at the moment is that we want to have some flexibility when it comes to investing. We believe that the old school buy and hold approach is dead, and the old school uh, let's invest in every asset class is dead. And we we take that approach with bonds as well. There's an area that we do not like. We stay away from it. You know, currently we're not in any junk or low credit quality. Um, you know, we are very careful with with how we're investing at the moment, with knowing that you know we could be at the top of the market, or this thing could go on for another year or two or a couple of years. You know, typically markets can stay uh, irrational longer than you can stay rational, and we always want to rationalize what's going on. The Fed may surprise us. The Fed may come out and you know, Rich, you mentioned four rate hikes. Maybe they get to two or three, the market falls apart, and they they back off again. Who knows? Uh, but right now, it certainly loves easy money. We are seeing rates increase a little bit. But I want you guys to keep this in mind as well. You know, we're at 1.7 and change on the 10-year Treasury. Back two years ago, we were much higher than this. So seeing yeah. these rates increase, it's yeah. not out of the question. Um, it's not, you know, I know it doesn't feel good when you're looking at your fixed income. So what we have done, instead of buying those individual bonds, so get a little bit more specific, is we've been trading ETFs. Now, we're not day traders. We don't trade every day, every week, sometimes not even every month. Um, but we're pretty active. And, you know, we, we trade on technicals and, and a very uh, defined discipline to ensure that, you know, we take the emotion out of these things. But on the fixed income side, when rates or bonds get very oversold, we're typically buyers of longer duration. Um, now, this takes a much more active approach. I know a lot of you guys probably don't have the time or the energy to do some of these things. But this is what we do day in and day out. Um, and then when, when rates inevitably, what we've seen is they've been pretty range bound. They'll go up, they'll kind of set a new high or get towards one, and then they'll drop again. And then they'll kind of step back up and then they'll do it again and repeat the process. So as they do, we try to take advantage of it. When we feel like they're up at the higher end of the range and look, it's very tough to kind of catch a falling knife, so to speak. So we, we nibble into some, some of these places in, in bite-sized chunks. Um, and, you know, we'll say, okay, it's at one point, you know, seven, five. We think this is pretty overdone. And I'm just giving an example here, not, not giving you, you know, uh, the, the exact numbers, but we we'll, we may go in at 1%. And if it goes up a little bit, we're saying, well, we're a little bit too early. Let's go in at another 1%. And what it enables us to do is to buy in and then inevitably, yes, rates drop and it may take a minute. Then we're able to liquidate and do it more for capital appreciation because look, let's face it, 
we're not seeing a lot of yield in the fixed income space. So that is why we've gotten away from buying individual bonds. We still do occasionally uh, when we find some opportunities, but the risk reward scenario is not what it once was. And so we're being very nimble there. Um, the inflation piece has been pretty easy. You know, I know a lot of people like the floating rates and we've, we've been in and out of floating rates at different times, but equities have been a great place to play the inflation trade. Um, real yeah. estate is another great place to trade yep. the, the inflation trade. These have been areas that have done well. And, you know, there's, there's going to become a point, I think, when we do see these higher rates, that at some point it's going to slow down the market. And look, that's what the intention is. It's to slow the economy down with higher rates uh, so it doesn't get too over, overheated. And we'll see these things happen over time. Uh, but it's going to create a lot of opportunity as we're beginning to see more volatility. We're seeing a lot of rotation trades. We're seeing some opportunity when it comes to the, uh, you know, the investment world. And so we're, we're remaining extremely nimble. And, you know, like talking to Lance about like a 2022 forecast, he says, man, you know, one thing we could do right now in three months, that may be the, the tide may have changed completely. and We need to be somewhere else. And so that is why we're being really nimble. Now, we're not just shifting the whole portfolio. We're, be, we're still remaining, um, you know, diversified amongst different holdings, but we don't feel like we need to be in every asset class in every space. So keep that in mind when you're investing. I know that's probably difficult for a lot of you people to do. You, no, it is. And you have to also keep in mind this inflation that we're seeing. And Danny and I talked about this in April, May of 2020 on the radio show that I was concerned that this, this, this kind of inflation was not going to be transitory uh, because just the old adage one is that, yes, there's supply chain issues, but we had too much money chasing too few goods. I wrote a piece about it in April 2020. And the supply chain issues are more chronic than we think, right? Because every variant that comes out, it may not be dangerous, but it's highly disruptive. Just think about your whole office being out with the flu in this other variant, right? It stops everything. China's stuck. Um, it takes a long time for that supply chain issue to work itself out. But not only that, companies that have finally have pricing power besides Apple spending a thousand, Procter & Gamble, Kimberly Clark, Unilever, Mondelez, who makes Nabisco, my favorite Oreo cookies, right? They haven't had pricing power in years. They do now. When they increase yeah. the price on your Oreos, do they go back and reduce them? No, you might get a small oh, yeah. Oreo. But so here's the point. The overall trend of inflation that the Fed says is 2%, we raised to 2.5%. This, these big levels of inflation that you're seeing, I think by 2024, they really start to drop off. I don't think they go to 2%, but you might be more along 4% because of the supply chain issues working out. But there's one part of this inflation number that's transitory, one part that's permanent. And we have to see where wages go. Wage growth is very sticky. And if we have this great resignation and the labor force participation rate where it is, then you will have a higher level of inflation. But I think these seven, eight, nine levels, we, we start to peak and roll down from them. Yep, absolutely. So uh, another question around the fixed income space and inflation is what are the risks of buying bond funds now? So you know, one of the things that we do like about buying a, an individual bond is that we know exactly what we're going to get out of it. We're typically going to have to, at the moment, pay a premium for it, and you may get a yield of 5%, but your yield to worse or yield to maturity is going to be more likely, you know, be much lower because you're paying that additional premium. So maybe you get 3% out of it. So we know, regardless of what interest rates do, what the volatility of that, that bond looks like, if it's a quality bond, it's not going anywhere. We know exactly what we're getting out of it. But a, a bond fund has no maturity date. And they're always going in perpetuity, right? If something matures, they're buying something else inside of it. And so you have a lot of, of interest rate sensitivity here. So, you know, you need to be very mindful of what you own, what they're buying within it, what that turnover looks like on a year-to-year -year basis. And I think that um, the duration and credit quality are certainly going to be extremely important here moving forward. Um, you know, I-bonds, Rich, we've been getting a lot of questions about I-bonds from an inflation yeah. perspective. Um, we don't mind I-bonds. You know, we're seeing these articles that say, you're going to get seven and a quarter every year on I-bonds. No, look, look, they've had a very good, good time here recently. They're going to adjust that, uh, that rate every six months. They adjust every six months. And you can yeah, only you're going to be limited to $10,000 each year in it. So if you want to do a little bit of an inflation hedge, you think that's a good way to do it. It makes you, you know, it helps you sleep at night because it's, uh, it's, it's essentially, you know, backed by the treasury. Great. But I don't think you're going to get out of it what you would expect long term. And it could be very likely that there's going to be periods of time you don't make anything. 
one of my 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 one of my favorite uh, one of my mentors, one of my um, professors, uh, Z Bodhi at a Boston University, uh, who is also a friend of mine. He he he, he's one of the greatest writer on stocks and everything else and asset allocation. Every year he takes ten thousand dollars and he goes to Treasury Direct and he buys these I bonds, just as protection. I don't see anything wrong with it. If, just, if that's all you're going to do. But don't I don't know get, that that's where I would go. But yeah, I don't, but don't get seduced by 7% to Danny's point because it adjusts every six months. But if you believe there's going to be two and a half, three, four percent inflation, you know, if it's $10,000 out of your total portfolio, it's not going to affect you. It's, you know, it, it, it's not a bad, it's not a bad deal, but you got to do it through treasury direct. You got to understand how you can work. You can't, you can't own them in an IRA. You can only own them certain ways. You got to really understand that treasury direct. Okay. And it's not it's not as liquid, so it's a part of an emergency it's fund. Not not it's not liquid. It's not an emergency fund. No, and no, no. There's a penalty for liquidating early. So right. hey, uh, Rich, we're we're getting short on time. We try to keep these guys at, at right at an hour. We may yeah, go just go have it over. We've got go a ton ahead. of questions. So we're gonna move through some of these pretty quick. Um, Rich, outlook for changes with Roth conversions. You know, everybody knows we're big fans of Roths. We love them. Um, still able to do conversion as of last year. I believe we'll still be able to do a conversion as of this year. I think it's going to be very difficult for Congress to get anything through being an election year. Um, but with that yep. being said, we are seeing people doing backdoor uh, backdoor conversions now because that's been a big agenda item for them to discontinue that. Because, look, I know all you people sitting on $5 billion on this call in their Roth IRAs, you know, bad people, right? Um, no. Look, I think it's a great tool. Use it while you can. Um, it needs to be very strategic. We don't just blanket do conversions, but we want to run an analysis. Sometimes it can be a little uncomfortable because, you know, sometimes the analysis will be much more aggressive than what most people are, are probably, you know, prepared to do. But I think it's one of those things that you need to, to look at. You need to have that as part of your financial plan. And it is a fantastic tool. And, you know, the other question, Rich, was can somebody who's taken RMD still utilize these things? And the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, I think I everybody needs to be looking at this and going above and beyond. Now, at that age, you want to be careful with the IRMA charges, um, you know, which are going to be that that additional tax essentially on your social or excuse me, your Medicare benefits um, where you have that premium surcharge. It's a tax. That's exactly what it is. You're going to pay more if you make more. So keep all these things in mind. But I think we can still make some arguments that uh, it is a great tool to utilize. Roth conversions are not going away this year. Um, there's talk that maybe they phase out over 10 years. And then there's also maybe if you make $450,000 or more married filing jointly, there's a lot of silly stuff with Roth out there because yeah. Peter Thiel, who opened the Roth for $2,000 in 1999, put it in PayPal stack and it grew to 5 billion. Roth is the enemy now, right? That's a, that, that, that narrative is dying, okay? So if you could do a backdoor Roth, if you can do Roth conversions, you're still okay. I would continue to do them. Um, to, to Danny's point, I don't see any danger of, of that changing. And I haven't seen any of those proposals brought up again. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be one that's going to be difficult to do, especially in this year with, um, you know, such a contentious year being an election year and just the kind of the times that we're in. Um, it's not it's, going to and be And it's also elect- silly. It's yeah. so silly. It was just to battle the Peter Thiel thing. It's so silly because a Roth is the J.G. Wentworth of accounts. The government gets money now. When you do a Roth conversion, if I move 100000 from my IRA to Roth, I am going to owe ordinary income tax on that money. Ooh, I get my money now. What's wrong with that? Peter Thiel did this evil thing, which was legal, which means everybody's got to pay. Hopefully that narrative's dead. And he created a business which generates lots of taxes, pays lots of people. We can go down Don't the road. Don't be here. silly. So, Rich... Um, so, what? Real estate. We've talked a lot about real estate. Lance and I talked about this on Wednesday, how, um, you know, owning real estate in an IRA is not the best idea. And I want to be real clear here. We're talking about physical real estate or a, a multifamily deal, something that you can typically depreciate. Um, a REIT fund or a, a REIT ETF, that's different. You know, or we're not getting itself. the same, we're not getting the same tax benefits from that. Yeah. I mean, listen, um, Lifestyles Unlimited. Uh, Dell Wamsley, who I know very well, uh, but Dell at Dell will tell you that you take the money out of your IRA to buy the real estate because you're losing all the deduction. If I'm going to buy rental homes, 
then all the depreciation, everything else goes to waste if I buy it from my IRA. And there's nothing wrong with rental homes. That's a great passive income source that complements your portfolio. Inside your IRA, you can buy individual REITs. They might pay four or 5%. Nice way to shelter that income. REIT funds, REIT trust, you know, like, like Danny says. So you can own some form of real estate inside your IRA, but don't take it out uh, to buy it. It, it. I mean, don't, don't buy you know, uh, investment real estate in there. It's just not going to work. And people will ask, I want to buy my primary uh, residence and put it in my IRA. You can't do it. It's a prohibited transaction. The IRS will catch you. Yeah. So be, be cautious because there are a lot of, a lot of guys out there that are real estate guys that say, Oh, put it in your IRA. You can do a self-directed. We're seeing that they're, the IRS is cracking down on some things yes. like deemed distribution. So, yes. um, you know, just here recently, somebody bought the, um, some gold coins and essentially put them in their safe. And they said, look, this is a deemed distribution. A custodian had no oversight of this and they were taxed on all of it as a distribution and penalized. So we've got to be very cautious of what we're doing here. Um, you know, a lot of these will come with checkbooks. Every dollar that comes out of that has to go back in and any income that you receive from it has to go back in. But from a real estate perspective, we're not, we're not opposed to REITs or, you know, like mutual funds, ETFs, or even individual ones um, versus, buying the physical property or being a part of a partnership that will go purchase them like that multifamily or um, even commercial property, things of that nature. You just have yeah. to be cautious. Um, you want to make sure you take advantage of everything. In fact, we visit with a lot of people and I have some clients that have done that and they say, my biggest mistake, you know, one of my favorite questions is, you know, what would you have done differently? And, um, you know, every time that somebody's bought real estate inside of an IRA, I say, man, I screwed up. I, these have been, you know, especially ones that have been really good investments. They weren't able to reap all the benefits from it. And then they end up doing, you know, very aggressive Roth conversions, trying to get the funds out, things of that nature. So, um, you know, keep that in mind. So, Rich, we're getting some questions on 401ks and 401k management. Um, so, historically, we have had the plan manager within the newsletter. So, if you don't already, if you're not already signed up at realinvestmentadvice.com, go sign up for Lance's weekly newsletter. We also, you can get daily market commentary before the open each morning. Um, if you, you know, you want to see what's going on every day, just a quick one minute read, um, you know, we're going to provide that for you as well. But if you go to the retirement section, so it's out of the newsletter where it used to be at the bottom, go to the retirement section, you can find it there. But we're also able to do something now that we weren't able to do previously. We're able to manage 401ks. So if, you know, it's too much, uh, you have too much on your plate or you just say, you know what, I'm throwing my hands up, I'm done. Um, we're happy to help you guys with that as well. You know, give us a call. Like I mentioned earlier, you can always go to the end of this, answer a quick questionnaire if you want somebody to reach out to you. But we're able to do that. But you can find that on the retirement tab. And we're going to update that. Now, we don't update that as frequently as our portfolios, obviously, because there are some limitations as far as frequency of trading, things of that nature. And we're limited as far as what the investment options are. So keep that in mind. Um, we do update it. But, you know, if you're a client or you're somebody that follows the portfolios regularly at SimpleVisor, you can kind of see what we have going on. It's a little bit different and you're not going to see the rate of change nearly as quick. Want to elaborate on that at all, Rich? No. Yeah, I mean, there are people that can follow along and do a good job at Lance's 401k manager and make changes. But there are people that say, you know, I did this change and then I didn't look at it for a year and. So we can help you to make those changes. Uh, and Lance has done a really good job actually compiling all the larger firms, their 401k choices. So he's done a really a good job. Um, you know, it was a big job, you know, for almost every, every large firm out here um, that we know their choices and do the homework. So if you don't want to do it on your own, we can do it and we'll ebb and flow it based on the guidelines of your 401k. You know, when we want to sell down, we sell it there. Uh, it, and it works really well for a lot of people. But for some people, they follow the newsletter for self-directed and you want to do that, that's perfectly fine. We give you the information. Just make sure you look at it every week. doesn't change every week, but you want to make sure they understand the allocation we have set forth and make your adjustments accordingly in your 401k. Absolutely. Okay, guys. So uh, probably time for one, maybe two more questions here. Rich, what do you think about precious metals and what about precious metals inside of IRAs? You know, I don't know. You know, listen, I mean, I really thought gold would work just because of um, central bank instability. Uh, forget inflation or deflation. I really thought gold would work here and it's been stumping me. Um, 
all the metals have been stumping me. I'm, I'm surprised. Um, there are some timber companies and so forth that have done pretty well here because we're going through a new demographic wave and the need for housing with millennials buying homes. But, um, you know, they call, so they're like the barnacles of a ship. And it depends on what ship passes. In other words, there's no trend. So if you just want to feel you want some emotional snuggy and you want to own, you know, two to five percent or whatever of your net worth in hard assets, I mean, it's not going to hurt you. But it just you just have years that it might sit there for a very, very long time. And um, it's not income producing. I mean, it's that's, not that's income a... producing. You have to sell it. You know, again, we have a lot of people that own physical gold and, and other metals. I don't have any problem with it. It's part of your overall plan. But just understand, it's not liquid. And I don't see this. People will have this romantic notion that like Bitcoin is going to be the new currency. Well, OK, gold is going to be the new currency. We're going to back we're going to back the currency with gold again. No, we're not. We're just not. So it didn't work actually the first time, believe it or not. And I, I don't have all the time to give you the history lesson on that, but I don't see it. So there's like this romantic notion for gold. And I don't get I don't care. I think it's great you own it. I think it's good for as a, as a legacy to children, grandchildren. I don't think it's Bite sized chunks, though. So. Yeah, small chunks. You know, you might say, listen, it's 2% of my net worth. I keep it stored in my safe. Nothing wrong with it, but just remember it might sit there and not do anything for a while. Um, you can own precious metal uh, like the GLD. You can own that in your IRA. And actually, it's probably better to own it in your IRA because no matter, usually when you sell an investment after 12 months, you get its long-term capital gain. It could be taxed at a favorable rate. The gold ETFs work totally different. Anytime you sell them, it's ordinary income. So sometimes those are really good for IRAs. And a lot of those ETFs are backed by gold. So they, are, they do own bullion. Uh, so you are owning gold in essence. But what's nice is, to Danny's point, you've got a liquidity feature. You can go ahead and sell it at any time that you want. Yep. So almost about to wrap this up, guys. One, one last question. So we've been, we're getting a lot of questions on Roth conversions. And can you still do one for 2021? In second, oh. 22nd. Answer. Yeah, no, the answer is going to be absolutely not. You're not going to be able to do that. Now, you can still make contributions to an IRA um, for yes. 2021, all the way up till tax filing. However, right. those conversions are a 1231, December 31st date. And that's going to be a hard cutoff there. Um, right. You know, thank you guys for joining us today. We're right at an hour. We really appreciate you guys visiting with us, uh, spending your morning. Um, please answer the survey at the end. Additional questions you guys want to have. Uh, answered we'd love to visit with you if you want to visit one-on-one -on -one, we're happy to do that as well so please answer the survey and if you know you just want to go and say hey reach out to somebody we're happy to visit with you that way as well realinvestmentadvice.com we appreciate you guys time and uh you know we look forward to doing these more frequently and again here in 2022 y'all have a great saturday thank you <laughs>